Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 108 The Charade The Colchester Ripper War Baby here with another episode of Murderous Miners. By the spring of 2014, 33-year-old James Atfield had begun to resume a regular life, though he still suffered from memory loss caused by the severe head trauma he sustained when he was hit by a car while walking four years earlier. The father of five was still technically recovering, but he was well enough to resume regular activities like living on his own and socializing. In the early morning hours of March 29, 2014, Jim Atfield was heading home on foot after having a few drinks in a local pub when he was viciously attacked and left to die, the first victim of the Colchester Ripper. On this episode of Murderous Miners, we visit Colchester, Essex, UK, about 65 miles or 105 kilometers to the east and north of London, England, and the shocking crimes of 15-year-old James Fairweather, known as Britain's youngest serial killer. Prior to his grandmother's death, Fairweather was a happy child, keen to spend time with his family, playing in a darts club with his father. An early report card read that he was, quote, sensitive to the feelings of others. Later, as a student at Colchester Academy, he had good attendance, but it was after his grandmother died that family members and schoolmates recalled a change in the teen's behavior and personality. Even as early as 11 years of age, a teacher had commented on his behavior in a report saying that, quote, he is basically a thug. As he entered into his teenage years, his aggressive behavior toward his peers only intensified, and it was noted that he was bullied frequently at school and called names like Dumbo due to his ears. In the span of just a few years, Fairweather went from a quiet child to a violent teen, preparing to commit murder. His increasingly odd behavior, coupled with his growing paranoia, only fueled the raging interactions he had with classmates and teachers. The bullying carried over past school hours when Fairweather was cornered by a group of other teens and mugged at knife point. At Colchester Academy, pupils recalled him as an outcast with no friends who dressed differently and acted differently from everyone else. They thought he was scary and toward the end of his 11th year, he told other students that he was going to carry out a mass killing at school. Some were confident enough in his threat to stay home from school the next day. Fairweather had violent altercations with his classmates, regular outbursts in class, and told a teacher that he wanted to be a murderer when he grew up. His teachers had a difficult time dealing with him, with one writing in a progress report, quote, We will not always be able to prevent James from the consequences of his behavior. On January 20, 2014, about a year after he was jumped at knife point, Fairweather took a kitchen knife from his family home to a neighborhood shop and committed a robbery at knife point himself, demanding cash and stealing some cigars and other small items. He received 12 months of youth supervision and only days after he was sentenced, Fairweather, at age 15, killed for the first time. He was born in 1999 and at home on the Greenwood Estates, he lived with his older sister, mother who worked in a hospital, and father who worked for the Colchester United Football Club. Fairweather spent enough time on his own to be able to amass a collection of knives, a library of violent pornography, and films about killers and crime. He had a particular obsession with Peter Sutcliffe, the Yorkshire Ripper, and was thought to model his own murders after the serial killer. 
He was found to have researched killers such as the Moores murderers Mira Hindley and Ian Brady, the Stockwell Strangler Kenneth Erskine, who murdered seven elderly people in 1986, and Ted Bundy. There were books like The World's Worst Crimes and movies like Wrong Turn, The Carnage Collection, in his bedroom, and Fairweather had a copy of a documentary about Sudcliffe as well, along with mature-rated video games such as Call of Duty and Grand Theft Auto, which he'd been playing since the age of 13. Fairweather's internet search history mirrored what could be found out in the open in his room, with query after query in his browser history pointing toward the heavy consumption of inappropriate and damaging material. He had a picture of the Yorkshire Ripper on his phone and had read an article called Five Horrific Serial Killers Who Are Free Right Now. It's evident that his family members did not realize that the teen had such disturbing and damaging interests. A little more than three months after Fairweather held up his local shop at Knife Point, he waited until his parents fell asleep and climbed out of his second-story window around midnight, dropping quietly to the ground before heading out along Thorpe Walk, actively looking for a person to attack. After searching around his home and finding no potential victims, Fairweather expanded his search to Castle Park, coming across Jim Atfield lying on the riverside walkway of the River Cone. It seemed that Jim had stopped for a quick nap on his way home from drinking at his regular spot, the River Lodge Pub, in the early morning hours of March 29, 2014, as a lone passerby did later report that he'd seen the man dozing on a bench and asked him if he was okay. Castle Park was lovely and bustling during the day, but past midnight it was dark, Misty and generally deserted, but also safe. From that bench around 1 a.m., it seems that Jim found his way to lying down on the path, and it was there that Fairweather found him, dozing and unable to defend himself. He approached the sleeping man and, from above, stabbed him more than 100 times in the torso and abdomen, though many of these wounds were somewhat superficial, hesitation wounds a style of torture that some believe Fairweather picked up from researching the Yorkshire Ripper. Atfield also sustained a stab wound through the eye, an injury that Peter Sutcliffe was known to inflict on his victims as well. It was hours later at about 5.45 a.m. that a walker came across the frenzied scene and when emergency personnel arrived, they found the man completely covered in blood with one eye protruding from its socket. Though they tried desperately to resuscitate him, James Atfield died there in Castle Park, hours after James Fairweather had escaped into the night. He'd returned home, bundled up the clothes he was wearing and put them in a trash bag, discarding the bag in a dog waste receptacle located along Primrose Walk and tossing the knife into the river cone. As authorities began their search for the killer, the killer began having weekly visits with the local youth offending team as required under the terms of his sentence for the robbery. And he also planned his next murder, striking in broad daylight this time, two and a half months after Jim was killed on June 17, 2014. At approximately 10.56 a.m., a man was seen running away from the vicinity of the Salary Brook Riverside Trail, reportedly wearing a tan, belted, thigh-length coat with several large square pockets on the front, thought to be of Italian design. The body of 31-year-old student Nahid Almanea lay nearby in the overgrown grass next to the trail, along the path that she took each day to classes at the University of Essex, Colchester. She was a dedicated student with a background in science who was well-loved and well-respected by everyone who had interacted with her while she was at university. Usually, her brother accompanied her on the walk from their home in Woodrow Way in the Greenstead area to the campus in Wivenhoe, where she studied. But the day she encountered Fairweather lying in wait, she was alone. He attacked her from behind after she'd walked past him, stabbing her 16 times including straight through her abdomen and in both eyes. Just the same as he had two months prior, Fairweather threw the murder weapon into the river, bagged up his bloody clothing and put them out with the garbage. 
James Atfield and Nahid Almanea's bodies were found just two miles from each other and less than three months apart, sending the residents of Colchester inside their homes for safety. The BBC reported that following Jim's murder, the police sought, quote, six mystery men captured on surveillance cameras, a couple who had been seated on a bench, and a woman randomly mentioned by Jim on his Facebook page. However, no leads came from these inquiries. After Nahid had been killed, the internet was filled with implications that her death was linked to her Muslim religion when, in fact, her death was the random act of a 15-year-old who had set out from his home that day to kill. Her DNA was found in his home upon its later search. She'd only been studying in England for six months. The parks and walking trails and river walks usually full of people enjoying the weather turned empty as the search for the killer or killers took off. Despite some bloody sneaker prints leading from the scene of the Atfield murder and the sighting of the man in the coat running from the Almanea murder scene, investigators had no real persons of interest and no forensic evidence leading them toward any tangible suspects. The Almanea family said in a statement, quote, publicly, Nahid was a quiet and dignified lady who chose to pursue her academic studies in order to work towards her PhD, and whilst in England, she made a decision that she would respect her heritage and traditions in the way that she dressed and conducted herself. When she was with her family, Nahid was a warm and loving person who enjoyed laughter in the company of her parents, siblings, and extended family. Jim Atfield was a white British citizen, while Nahid Almanea was a Saudi woman only living in Britain to attend university. Nothing linked the two murdered individuals to each other. They had nothing in common that could be easily discerned and were killed at completely different times of day. Appealing to the public for any potential owners of that jacket seen on the person of interest became a high priority, and it was the best lead police had to go on. Thirteen days after Nahid's murder, police questioned James Fairweather regarding his whereabouts on that day as part of a campaign to speak to the 70 local residents affiliated with knife crimes in the area. He told police that he was at home the morning of June 17, 2014, searching the internet and playing video games, and his mother, who had accompanied him to the interview, corroborated this, but she had only spoken to him on the phone. He had only told her that he was home. She hadn't actually been there with him. So Fairweather was cleared. Investigators believed he and his mother's explanation that he was at home alone the morning that Nahid Almanea was killed. Police had no evidence or suspicion that Fairweather was involved in Nahid's murder, and he wasn't questioned in relation to the unsolved murder of James Atfield three months earlier. As the days rolled on and the investigation continued, Fairweather searched for his next victim, but he was luckily never able to actually find one. The increased security amongst residents and scrutiny on the area by police had made most everyone more aware of their surroundings and less likely to find themselves out and about alone, making it impossible for Fairweather to find another unsuspecting random victim. For the next 11 months, he was monitored in school following his arrest for the robbery, spending time sequestered from his classmates in the exclusion room. Fairweather was also having weekly contact with the youth offending team per his robbery sentence, all the while searching for someone else to kill. He attended classes, sat for his GCSE exams denoting the end of his high school journey, while police searched for one killer or two unrelated killers. They honestly just didn't know. The public did what they could, including trimming back bushes and shrubbery to eliminate shady hiding places. One thing that residents felt sure of was that the killer had to be an outsider because who among them would simply murder at will? Multiple composite sketches were released to the public, but none looked like Fairweather. A £10,000 reward was set up for information, but no one ever came forward. Fairweather was watching all of this play out, making him confident that he could kill again, if only he could locate a victim. 
It wasn't until almost a year after Nahid's murder that a solid lead from the public finally came in when, on May 26, 2015, a woman walking her dog along the Salary Brook Riverside Trail noticed someone suspicious lurking near the area where Nahid's body had been found. The young man she saw intimidated her with his presence and gaze, causing her to turn around and head the other direction, dialing police. He was wearing a jacket similar to the one seen publicized by police. The caller stayed on the line, describing the suspicious man as lurking in the bushes and having no dog although they were at the dog walk portion of the trail. He tried to flee, but the officer arrived within 10 minutes and located Fairweather quickly. He told the officer that he was simply out for a walk to clear his head, saying that he quote, didn't quite feel right. When asked, he pulled his hands from his pockets, revealing to the officer that he was wearing work gloves with rubber gripping. The officer then pulled from Fairweather's pocket a switchblade-styled knife. The teen was taken into custody and questioned by investigators, describing in full graphic detail how he murdered Nahid Almanea and also Jim Atfield, with plans to kill at least 15 more. Following a year-long investigation costing more than 2.6 million pounds that involved 1,500 officers, the dragging of river bottoms, and the examination of over 500 hours of surveillance camera footage, the Colchester Ripper had been caught due to the information released about the distinctive jacket. Imagine you're in a plane flying over the Andes. You notice that the wings of the aircraft are getting dangerously close to the snowy peaks. And then in an instant, everything changes. From Wondery, against the odds, Plane Crash in the Andes is an all-new season that looks at the unbelievable survival story of a terrifying plane crash and the passengers' grueling fight to stay alive. The plane, which carried a Uruguayan rugby team and their fans, crashed in the high Andes. The 32 survivors must battle sub-zero temperatures and razor-thin air while they wait for rescuers to arrive. But then, as days pass, they realize no rescue is coming. They're on their own in this frigid and desolate landscape. How will they keep themselves alive without food, water, or warm clothing, and with no means of contacting the outside world? This season of Against the Odds, Plane Crash in the Andes is the unbelievable story of their unlikely survival. This remarkable tale of survival truly depicts the strength of a person's will to live, showing that people will sometimes do anything, just for the opportunity to survive another day. Listen to Against the Odds on Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in the Wondery app. Wondery. Feel the story. Fairweather told police that he left his home that night in January to find someone to kill, claiming that the voices in his head had instructed him to find a sacrifice, and that when he'd finally come across Jim sleeping in the grass, the voices told him to attack. Some the voices were talking to me, you need to make a sacrifice or we're going to come and get you, you need to do it. And I saw him, it was, where, it was on the land on the grass, as fast asleep, where he was drunk. And he goes, he goes, he's the one, he's the one, he's the one. While I was doing that, my voices were laughing and laughing and laughing louder and louder. He said that Jim had let out a piercing scream that cut right through Fairweather, who said he then went into a rage and began using, quote, lots of force as he began stabbing the man in the stomach and head, leaving a huge gash on his scalp. He went into a rage for two or three minutes, he said, adding that, quote, When you're in a rage and you hear voices laughing at you, you get really good strength. Regarding Nahid's murder, Fairweather said that the petite, five-foot-tall woman hadn't noticed him as she walked by alone, on her way to class, describing how he stabbed her through the kidneys with a ten-inch bayonet-style knife. He told them that he'd killed her with stabs to her eyes after she whirled around and her sunglasses flew off, so that she, quote, couldn't see evil. He explained that the media coverage of his crimes had driven everyone inside, but that the voices compelled him to hunt, saying, quote, They said we need another sacrifice and I was going to get my third victim, but there was no one about. 
Just as his, quote, favorite serial killer Ted Bundy did, Fairweather tried to blame constant consumption of graphic images and violent pornography, claiming that they caused him to begin experiencing psychotic episodes by the age of 14. He tried to say that bullying led to the voices in his head, which he said began around age 11. While awaiting trial, Fairweather was subjected to interviews and examinations by three experts from the defense and one from the prosecution. Fairweather admitted to manslaughter but denied premeditated murder based on diminished responsibility due to his mental state, meaning that both Jim Atfield's and Nahid Almania's loved ones were forced to endure a murder trial. It was noted that he had researched the Stockwell Strangler, who had successfully tried this same defense. His 11-day trial began in April 2016 at the Guildford Crown Court, and the jury heard that not only was Fairweather diagnosed with Asperger's syndrome, but all three psychiatrists for the defense determined that the voices he claimed to hear were authentic and had influenced his decisions to commit murder. Specifically, Fairweather's defense barrister Simon Spence felt his diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder affected his crimes in that, quote, Obsession is a very recognized characteristic of somebody suffering from autism, and the obsession was obviously growing. You could see a growing trend of this material being accessed. Somebody being autistic doesn't make them violent. The difficulty is that somebody suffering from autism can be more obsessive than somebody who is not, and if the thing they become obsessive with is extreme violence, then that is what can put their obsession with extreme violence and make it a reality. And that's the role that I felt James's autism had to play. The prosecution's expert witness, forensic psychiatrist Dr. Philip Joseph, agreed with that diagnosis, however disagreed about the voices being authentic saying that Fairweather's claims that he had auditory and visual hallucinations were, quote, extremely unconvincing and a bit cliched, adding that, quote, every time he's talking about voices, he's doing it to distance himself from what he's done. He called him an emerging psychopath and felt that the voices he was hearing were really just his own internal dialogue. He compared Fairweather talking about his voices to something, quote, you might see in a horror film and that, quote, likely the defendant wanted to emulate the acts of serial killers he had read about. And though he did think that Fairweather had a burgeoning personality disorder, Dr. Joseph didn't feel that this would have kept the teen from forming rational thoughts. Fairweather had told more than one doctor that he had collected clippings about the murders and that they made him feel excited and powerful. The thought of serial killers, quote, turned him on, he said, and he told Dr. Simon Hill that, quote, he was on a mission from the devil. At closing, Fairweather's attorney summed up his client as, quote, a 15-year-old boy caught up in what I want to describe as the perfect storm of autism, increasing isolation and paranoia, leading to the psychosis which led him to kill. He pointed out that three psychiatrists believed that Fairweather was compelled by voices and that, quote, the effect of the voices on the fantasies, that is what triggers the change from passive interest in a topic, however abhorrent, to acting them out. He also told the jury that to believe Dr. Joseph would mean that Fairweather deceived three out of the four psychiatrists that had evaluated him prior to trial. Such a feat would require a, quote, Oscar-worthy acting performance from the teen that the psychiatrist didn't believe he was capable of at 15 years old. He felt that though some type of mental disturbances likely existed, the voices were all a charade. The jury also heard about the emotional and financial toll that Jim Atfield's murder had on his family, with his mother so affected that she became unable to work and the family home had to be sold. The brother of Nahid Almania spoke about how guilty he still felt at not being able to protect his sister and save her life, saying that he now lives a, quote, meaningless life in the eyes of his family. After 11 days of trial and eight and a half hours of deliberation, the jury found James Fairweather guilty of two counts of murder. The 17-year-old had no visible reaction to the reading of his guilty verdicts.
At sentencing a week later, on April 29, 2016, Mr. Justice Spencer told Fairweather at the Old Bailey in London that it was evident that the teen's near obsession with famous killers undoubtedly propelled him to commit murder himself, and it was obvious to the judge that he was emulating them. He added that if Fairweather had been older, he would likely be sentenced to a whole life term, but was instead given two life sentences with a minimum of 27 years. He again showed no emotion, but reportedly mouthed, quote, I don't give a shit. Within a month, it was made public that Fairweather was set to appeal what he considered to be an excessive minimum sentence. However, his sentences were upheld that September, with the decision reading, quote, We are not persuaded. It was manifestly excessive in an extremely serious case in which an experienced trial judge took much care over the process of sentencing. In the circumstances, we are not persuaded that the judge fell into error in fixing the minimum term which he did. James Fairweather, the Colchester Ripper and Britain's youngest modern serial killer, is now 22 years old and has roughly 22 years left in custody on his minimum sentence.